part of. Amen? Amen. It is so good to see you all. If you are visiting, we are glad to have you with us this morning. If you are just passing through, thank you for taking the time to, to stop and worship with us as we approach the throne of our God. If you are new to the area or you are looking for a new church home, uh, give us time to talk to you, please. We'd love to, to share with you about who we are here at Highland Heights, what we believe, and uh, we, we hope that you'll spend some time with us, stay for Bible class. We hope that you'll come join us this afternoon at, at 4 o'clock over at our, our new property at the corner of, of um, I get the roads right in a minute, Coles Ferry and, and uh, Castle Heights, across from the Jimmy Floyd Center. We're going to be spending our afternoon out there, a period of worship, and then we're going to have some fun together and enjoy a meal together there as well. It's just good to have a family to lean upon, is it not? It's good to have a group of people that you can get with regularly that not just have, have common interests like food, <laughs> but that we serve the same God, that we have the same faith, we have the same goals. And uh, that's one of the things we're going to talk about this afternoon, being united together in a cause and a purpose and the things that come as a result of us choosing to be united together as a group of people behind that cause. This morning, however, we are continuing with our series we started last week, Leaf Swatters and Root Choppers. And uh, in, in this series, we are, we are examining the biblical expectation for Christians to develop strong personal character. Strong character that is, that is rooted in our saving faith. I have become convinced convicted, I guess, if you will, making exceptions for those who have gone through traumatic experiences or those that are, that are battling physiological imbalances and, and physical problems. But I, I have become convinced that, that a lack of strong personal character is one of the top reasons, one of the top causes of so many people, Christians included, having lives that, that, are, that seem to be this never-ending cycle of dramatic problems. Things that we, we keep battling the same issues in our lives over and over and over again. And I think that one of the biggest reasons is because we haven't developed the kind of character that is going to point us to solutions, that is going to help give us the fortitude to work our way through those things instead of just battling them year after year as, as we go on through our lives. The title for our lesson, the seed thought of our, the title for our series, comes from a quote by Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau made the statement, For every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. For every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. In springboarding from this thought, we have observed last week that, that most people tend to fall into one of these two categories. They tend to either be leaf swatters or root choppers. Leaf swatters are those who, who hack at the externals of life, thinking that... that if I can just deal with the things that are purely on the outside, that that will bring about substantial life change. We talked about the fact that, that some of the things that characterize leaf hackers is that they, they tend to blame others for their problems. It's your fault that I'm angry. It's your fault that I have so much stress. It's your fault that I failed. They also tend to be controlled by their circumstances instead of taking control of what they can. Leaf swatters usually tend to rely on, on quick-fix solutions, the band-aids and aspirins of life to try to get what they want. Ten easy steps to get your child to obey you better today. Those types of things. Root choppers, on the other hand, understand that, that substantial life change only comes when you focus on the internal changes that feed the externals. Root choppers demonstrate this in that they take responsibility for their own actions and for their own emotions. They don't allow somebody else to control them. 
they take control of themselves. They focus more on what they have the ability to influence instead of worrying about the circumstances that they have no control over. Doesn't mean that they're not affected by them, but they don't focus upon them. Root choppers work to develop their personal character to actually be what they want to be instead of putting up a facade to make people think they are something else. If you want to be a better spouse, if you want to have your spouse love you more, then you need to be the kind of spouse that's worth loving. Kids, if you want to be respected and trusted by your parents, you need to be the kind of child that is trustworthy. We need to be these things. And so that's what root choppers do. They, get in, they, they focus on the internals that wind up coming out as externals in their lives. Our primary text comes from 2 Peter chapter 1. And I would invite you to turn there for a moment. We're actually going to spend uh, a little bit of time in Isaiah 42 if you want to turn there, and uh, if you want to have your Bibles turn there. But our primary text for our series comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, in which the apostle writes to us, he calls for Christians to make every effort to supplement your faith with the kinds of traits that are indicative of strong character. And these right here are the six, uh, seven characteristics that he lists in that chapter. It's not a comprehensive list. We can go all throughout the Scriptures and find other character, uh, character traits, other qualities that would, that would fall within this, but these are the ones that Peter gives for us, and so this is where our, our, uh, this is where our focus is lying in these, in these lessons. Our plan is to examine these seven traits individually to try and get a better picture of what a growing faith-based character looks like so that if it's necessary for us to move from being swatters to being choppers, we will know what that needs to be, how that needs to, to manifest itself in our lives. And if we happen to be one of those that are choppers, if you are a root chopper, hopefully this study will, will bring greater strength and greater conviction to the things that you, are, that you already know and that you are already practicing in your life. But as we dig into this thing then, we're, we're going to begin with the very first one on Peter's list. He actually starts with faith, but we're going to, we're going to move past that. And we're going to get to this one. This, this quality of virtue. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Of all of the qualities contained in this passage, virtue is, in my humble opinion, the most difficult of them to extrapolate a concise meaning and application for. In some ways, to speak of virtue strikes me as, it strikes me as, as sort of the, the catch-all word for the overall concept of character. Many people will actually equate virtue with character and use them synonymously. And perhaps there is truth to that idea. Part of what makes it so difficult in, in this passage, though, is the actual usage of this word within the Scriptures. The, the Greek word that Peter uses here is arete. Now, I'll give you that one for free. I won't charge you for that today. But the Greek word is arete. In classical Greek, this word arete meant the God-given ability to perform heroic deeds. It also came to mean, in, in, in classical Greek, the, the quality of life that made someone stand out as excellent. When it comes to the New Testament, what we find is that this is a very rare word in the New Testament. It's only used four times in the entirety of the 27 books of the New Testament. You find these passages, and interestingly enough, Peter uses them three out of the four times. Peter uses it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says that he uses it in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, se I'm sorry, rather, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, as well as verse 5, which is our text. And then Paul uses it once in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. In English versions, 
When you read through, we'll look specifically at, at verse 5 of our text. In English versions, it gets translated out different ways. English Standard, King James, New King James, use the word virtue. The NIV and the Christian Standard use the term goodness. The New American Standard and New Living Translations will translate this word out as moral excellence. All of which are accurate, all of which give us a, a sense of what virtue is. It, but but while, while seeing all of this is, is helpful, for me personally, just to look at these, these translations leaves, me, uh, leaves us almost lacking the precision that we might want and need to fully understand what is virtue. At which point I would suggest to you that perhaps it's helpful for us to go to the Old Testament uses of the word. Now, somebody says, wait a minute, Corey, you're talking about Greek words here and the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. You're right. However, there is a major, major document that was, that was created centuries ago called the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And it was very widely accepted as being, uh, as being accurate, as being something that was trustworthy, so trustworthy, in fact, that the Septuagint is actually the source of the Scriptures that Jesus and the, uh, and the New Testament writers quote the most from. They quote from the Septuagint more than they do from the literal Hebrew. And so when we turn to the Septuagint... Perhaps we can look at some of the uses of, that those translators put into play in order for us to understand how did they use the word arete in order, and what did their usage convey from Scripture. This is where I'd like for you to open up to Isaiah chapter 42. In Isaiah chapter 42, there's two passages, two verses that use this word. We had them as part of our Scripture reading this morning. And I want you to take a look at how the Old Testament uses this term virtue. In Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8, the prophet says, or the Lord speaking through the prophet says, I am the Lord. It is my, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Arate is translated as praise. Skip down to verse 12 of the same passage. Let them give glory to Yahweh and declare His praise in the coastlands. Turn over to the next chapter and look at Isaiah 43, verse 21, and you find it yet again. The people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. This is the consistent translation of this idea of arete, of virtue, that you find throughout the Old Testament. So here's what I want you to... I want you to notice what's happening here in the book of Isaiah as, as this, this concept is coming through. And I, uh, here, arete is that for which God is praised. It is those things for which God is praiseworthy. In chapter 42, verses 8 and 12, you find the term arete is an expression that is poetically paralleled to the glory of God. Thus, God's glory is His virtue. The things which flow from His character, God's excellencies are those things for which He is worthy of praise. Why? Think about any characteristic of God that you would understand as being something that He needs to be praised for. That's what we're talking about. And this understanding of praiseworthy attributes, of God's praiseworthy attributes, carries over to the New Testament as well. I told you that this word appears, this word virtue, appears four times in the New Testament. I want you to consider the way that, that, it's, de that it's used in two of those passages. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter makes the statement, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. 
Why are we those things? Why has God made us this holy nation, royal priesthood, and the possession of His own? He has made us these things so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Here, arete is translated as excellencies. You will also find in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, just before our usage in verse 5, Peter makes this statement, His divine power has given us, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. He called us to what? To His own glory and to His own excellence. So again, here's what I submit to you. I submit to you that virtue in the Scripture seems to be descriptive of those qualities that are found in the nature and the work of God which are worthy of praise and adoration. The virtues, virtue are the qualities of God's nature and work that are worthy of praise and adoration. And when you think of virtue from this standpoint, I know that that's maybe a little deeper, a little complicated. Hang on with me here because I'm going to bring this to us now. When you think of virtue from this standpoint, perhaps we begin to get an idea of what this means for us as believers who are trying to be root choppers and develop strong personal character. When Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, to supplement our faith with virtue, he is admonishing us to pursue excellence that is in line with the character of God. He is admonishing us to hold ourselves to high standards of conduct and thought as partakers of the divine nature of God. That's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. He made us to be partakers of His divine nature. And as partakers of that divine nature, we are seeking to emulate the character of the Holy One. We want to see God's nature lived out in our lives. Now, we do this not with the expectation of perfect execution. Is there anybody here that has perfectly, perfectly executed the good character of God? No, I didn't think so. That's why grace is so great. God's grace fill, makes up for, God's grace covers my shortcomings as far as perfect execution is concerned. But rather, what, what we are talking about is living with the understanding that the standard we hold ourselves to in life is going to play a huge factor in the quality of the person we become. A general rule of thumb. If you set a low bar of expectation, you're going to get a low bar of performance. You set the bar of performance or expectation low, the quality of the person is going to match and is going to only match that low bar. However, if you set a high bar of excellence, a high standard of, of expectation, you're going to start see the you're going to see the quality of an individual rise up to that. I'm there was a book that came out. I mean, let me apply this for our young people here for just a minute. It was a book that came out a handful of years ago. It's called Do Hard Things. A couple of teenage twin brothers got, sat down together and they started writing out a book because they began to notice, they began looking around and say, you know, teenagers are not expected to do an awful lot these days. And so they started doing some, some, some history and some digging and, and, and they said, why is it that, that teenagers in particular wind up not meeting very high levels of excellence. And here was one of the things that they concluded. One of the reasons why teenagers, why young people do not live up to high standards of excellence is because as a culture, we've stopped expecting high things from our teenagers. Because when you think of teenagers, what do you think? Sowing the wild oats, oh, it's that, it's that decade there where they have no responsibility. No, you know, we're, we expect them to do dumb things. And so guess what? 
as a demographic, teenagers don't normally disappoint. Teens, look at me here, please. If you're not, look at me. Hold yourself to a higher standard than what the world is going to hold you to. You can do so much more than what culture tells you a teenager is supposed to be doing. And as believers, God is calling you to something more than that. He is calling us, not just teens now, let's talk about all of us. God is calling all of us to pursue after excellence in our lives. To set a higher standard of conduct and a higher standard of thought that emulates the character of God. And let me tell you, church, there is no higher standard to chase after than God's standards. But as we close out, I want to give you a couple of practical thoughts on this, on, on recognizing and, and developing this trait of virtue, of excellence within our lives. Number one, we need to realize that the concept of virtue is already inside of you. You already have a basic fundamental idea of what virtue is, and it is ingrained within your soul. I believe that God has given this understanding to every single human being as an innate understanding of what virtue looks like. Now, not everybody in our world recognizes that it comes from God. Not everybody understands that virtue as, as a concept is, is a mimicking of the character of God. But I believe that it is something that God has put inside of each and every one of us, this desire and this understanding that virtue is emulating His excellencies, the character traits of God's nature that are worth being praised. Let me try to illustrate this for you. Earlier in the week, many of you helped me out with this. Earlier this week, I threw out on Facebook. That's a great place, you know, right? It's one of the greatest sources of information. I put out there on Facebook, I said, hey, I need a little bit of help. I need, I need people to respond, and I want you to give me up to five qualities that you consider to be virtues. Let me give you just a sampling of what I saw here. I know you can't read this real well, so I'll read it for you. These are just some samples of some of the things that I got. Honesty, loyalty, courage, integrity, sobriety, a servant's heart, selfless, committed, forgiving, honest, respectful, faith, hope, love, forgiveness, charity, empathy, gratitude, integrity, perseverance, service, honesty, respect, modesty, diligence, patience. Honesty, compassion, valor, justice, honor, sacrifice, spirituality and humility. Compassion, honesty, courage, respect, humility, kindness, patience, forgiveness, honesty, faithfulness, greatness, uh, I'm sorry, gentleness, trustworthiness, self-control, patience, humility. You get the idea of what people were putting out there? Now let me ask you a question. As you're listening to me read all these things off, can you hear... Can you hear the natural falling in line with characteristics that we tend to use of God? Is God compassionate? Is God honest? Is God self-controlled? Is God forgiving? These are things that we, that, that we just that, that, that laid it out there. I had 34, 35 people respond. And these are the things that people are coming up with. Why? Because God has put this inside of us. We know what virtue looks like. Somebody says, well, wait a minute, Corey. Most of your friends on Facebook are Christians. Most of them are, are going to be people that know these things about God. And so, so maybe, maybe you've got a skewed, a skewed concept here and that you, you, know, you, you dealt with godly people who gave you the response. Well, that's true, but... I'm going to hold to my point because of this. While it is true that most of the people within my own circle are godly-minded people, I still contend that those who are not godly-minded people understand the same thing, even though they may not understand that this comes from God. I've been reading a book here uh, lately by, by a man who, who is uh, he, he's the owner and the founder of a multi-billion dollar company. He's in, the top, he's in the top five or ten on Forbes magazines as being some of the most important companies in the, in, the financial, in the financial sector. 
This man is not a God-fearing man. He is a devout evolutionist. And yet in this book, he speaks about some of the principles that he, puts in play, that he has put in place within his own company. Because he has understood through life that when these principles are put in place, you succeed more. You have better outcomes at life. You want to know some of the things that he has learned through his life? He has learned that in order to achieve the kind of success that you want in life, you need to have radical honesty. You need to own up to your own mistakes and not blame other people and not hide them. He says, he says that, that one of the best principles he ever put in place was that he expects his employees to consider the interests of others before they consider their own. Does that sound biblical to you? It does to me. And this is not a man who is a devout follower of God. What should that tell you? That tells you, it tells me at least, that within each and every one of us, the concept of virtue is there because God has given it to us. So if you are looking to try and identify virtue in your life, to become a virtuous person, understand first and foremost, God is giving you this understanding, it's deep down inside. But because it's deep down inside of you, that in and of itself is not enough is not enough to set the bar for moral excellence. Our own human intuition does not set us a good moral standard, does it? I mean, think about it. When, when mankind is left to define morality and excellence on his own, we rarely set the bar where God wants it to be set. And so the second thing I would, I would suggest to you is that as we pursue virtue in our lives, as we pursue excellence modeled after God's character, we need to take the time to purposefully identify these traits in our lives. We need to take the time to sit down with pen and paper and think about what are the virtues of life that I want people to see in me? What are the virtues of life that need to come out in my character, in my interactions, in my thoughts, and in every deed that I do? Christians, we've got to be doing the same thing. Some of us, we, don't, some of us, we talk in such, in such vague, ambiguous terms that we don't really know what we're talking about. What do you want to be in life? I want to be a Christian. Great, wonderful. How, how do you want your life to look? I want my life to look like Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, well, it means I'm conformed to the image of His Son. Great, tell me, what does it look like for life to be conformed to the image of Jesus? Well, well it, it, it's, it's emulating God's character. What are you emulating? What traits are you seeking to have in your life? Get specific. Doesn't mean you'll make the list once. Doesn't mean you'll make it in a single day. You're going to constantly be coming back to it, but we've got to start taking the time to be specific of identifying these traits in our lives. We, shooting from the hip is not a good way to develop character. We need to be able to actively discern between the discern the difference between excellence, mediocrity, and debased. You need to be able to tell the difference between them. And as, I, and as I've wrestled my way through figuring out how to say this, I'll tell you the, the, the verse that, that it seems to me that this idea of purposefully identifying virtuous traits in our lives that we want to pursue, I think this is part of what Paul is talking about in Romans 12 verse 2 when he says that we are to not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, so that you may discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. That doesn't come when shooting from the hip. That comes from purposeful, intentional thought. And so I want to encourage you this week to sit down with pen and paper, or pencil and paper if you think you're going to need to erase. I want you to sit down with pen and paper and I want you to start writing out the list of virtues that you want in your life. The virtues that you believe 
God is calling you to emulate in your life and you start working on developing those in your life. But then finally, here's my last thought. It's not going to be enough just to write the list down because here's what happens to too many people. They say, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm going to start writing it down. And they write out their list of virtues and things that they want to do. And then it gets shuffled into a drawer somewhere or it gets set under a stack of books and they never see it again. Which is why then we need to regularly and actively think upon these virtues. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, Paul has his one single use of the word arete in all of his writings. And Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any arete, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. We need to be taking time every day to reflect upon the virtue in our lives. Don't just make the list and forget about it. Think about the situations in your life where these, where these qualities are going to be tested and determine how you can best demonstrate excellence in those areas. Pray that God will guide you and prompt your mind to act with integrity and virtue and character in every moment of the day. Because the more we ingrain these in our minds, the more they will begin to come out in our actions. To develop strong faith-based character, the bar must be set high. We cannot set the bar of character down here and expect to be the kind of people that God has called us to be. Which is why we are told to supplement our faith with virtue, because virtue is that bar. Pursuing and embracing excellence in conduct and thought that are in line with the character of God. And when we are virtuous people, we will find ourselves numbered less with those who are swatting leaves and more with those who are chopping at roots. This morning, if you need to become a Christian, if you need to give your life to Jesus in the waters of baptism, you have that opportunity. And we want to help you with that. We're going to sing a song in just a moment to give you that opportunity to respond to the Lord's invitation. Or if you're here and you are realizing maybe there's something we've said this morning, maybe there's, maybe there's certain aspects of your virtuous character that are lacking. And you need prayers for strength, you need prayers for guidance and discipline to chase after the excellencies of God. We want to pray with you. We want to help each other on this road. That's the other thing about this pursuit of, of excellence. It's not something you have to do on your own. God gave you a family to help hold you accountable. God gave you a family to encourage you along the way. If we can encourage you and help you and pray for you this morning, please let us do that. The invitation's yours. What are you going to do with it while we stand and sing?